But again, I understand. You see, you have been taught by Alex Haley and others that your history started in the slave trade. But they don't even tell you how the slave trade started. They blame you for enslaving yourself. They say your ancestors sold you up. Nice statement. So I asked the guy, what country, what was the name of the king? Oh, don't worry about that, they sold you out. As if I don't know that the slave trade started with the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church by the name of Martin V and Reverend Bartolomeo de las Casas on the island of Hispaniola now called Haiti and Santo Domingo. You see, you weren't made, you were, nobody told you it's time to get sorry, to feel bad when some Haitians were being slaughtered on the coast of Florida. That's what it is. If you send a people back to sea on the condition where they were, that's genocide. But you see, you didn't feel anything because you weren't taught to realize that the Haitians are your brothers and sisters because you don't know that the first Africans to be brought in slavery was not taken from Africa but from Spain and carried to Haiti then called Hispaniola in 1506 under the aegis of the Pope of the Roman Church and Bartolomeo de las Casas. But how did you get in Spain? That was 1506. But you went into Spain, which was then called Iberia, Spain and, and, and Portugal and southern France, as conquerors yourself in 711, under the leadership of Tariq, for whom the rock of Gibraltar is now named Gibraltar. Nothing in your education, because there's nothing in your textbook about any of this. So you'll have to go to Spain. Luckily, at the University of, Salam of uh, Barcelona, where I attended for two years, there are these documents, and I had never known anything about them. I hadn't known that the Africans called Moors had ruled Spain from 711 until 1485. The last of them losing power at a place called Granada. I was always wondering why is it that 90% of all the songs coming out of Spain were singing to La Morena, the black woman. So how come in this country, 90% of all the songs, the records, the tapes, everything is La Morena this and La Morena that. It is when I went there, I found out La Morena raised hell in Spain. You see, people don't want me to feel. If you kill one European Jew in Ushkush, because he is Jewish, the whole white Jewish community getting armed. But if you kill umpteen blacks, I am not supposed to say anything, otherwise I'm being racist. You see, they didn't tell you that they're black people who are Jews. So you say, blacks and Jews are going to have a conference. Couldn't be black Jews too? Oh, you never heard of the Falashas, the Ethiopian Jews? I'm one. I know that I don't look Jewish, but they don't look Jewish to me either. <laughs> they are called the Falashas, but you didn't hear anyone saying anything in America when the Italian fascists were exterminating the Falashas. Nobody said anything. And it was the forerunner to what Hitler was to come and do next. But there was no rallying cry about my people. We were five million when Hitler arrived, I mean uh, Mussolini arrived. With the help of the Pope, Martin uh, 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 Pius uh, 11th, I think it was. When the Italians left, we were 50,000, but no cry. Isn't it strange that when you write and when you are taught, you hear only about a Holocaust, a one. 
What happened to your Holocaust that's still going on? What happened to the 50 million Africans, your brothers and sisters, that were murdered in Munamatapa, no call South Africa, under Cecil John Rhodes? Do you know that black folks take scholarship in honor of John Rhodes, Cecil John Rhodes? Because you don't know. Nobody told you who Rhodes was. Rhodes make Hitler look like a playboy. You don't know about the Holocaust with Dr. John, with um, Frederick Lugard and Dr. Jemison in what is today called Nigeria. With Goldie and others when they took over the colony. You don't know about the Holocaust with Leopold II the Vanderbilts and the Pews and the, and the others, the Rockefellers and so forth, when they took over what was called Mani Congo in those days and changed it to the Congo Free State. How many millions? 22 million? Were exterminated. African women pregnant were placed in the middle of roads and three limbs put to both arms then cut with the horses and split them open and the babies fell out as punishment that the men would see it. These are records. They themselves wrote not realizing that Africans will come later to revenge these causes. But that isn't mentioned as Holocaust in any of your textbook because it was only Africans being exterminated. I don't expect enemies to say this but I do expect that when you write and when you do your research that you use the appropriate term genocide holocaust wherever it applies in Tasmania an island of Australia every last African was murdered there isn't one left and you don't call it a holocaust you don't cry about it. You don't get up any day complaining. Nobody comes to you and asks you, but you cry for everybody else's Holocaust. Because you weren't taught that these people had anything at all to do with you. You forget that the slave boat did not come from Africa to America. It came from Africa to the Caribbeans, from the Caribbeans to America. The first boat that brought Africans here were not from Africa, but from Barbados first that came to Virginia in 1619 in Jamestown. So you weren't told that there's any connection. As a matter of fact, the people from Alabama don't feel anything for the people of New Jersey. And the people of New Jersey don't feel anything for the people of Mississippi, etc., etc. We have not been taught that way. Thus, we couldn't even have with Jesse an African drive for an African people in the midst of the drive, we had to change to rainbow. And you stood here and got on your knees and begged for a holiday for Dr. King. You disgraced Dr. King. The enemy never award his foe with a holiday. The Italians got a day for a man that got lost, couldn't find his way. Columbus Day, they didn't go to anybody for the holiday. The Irish got a day for a man that killed snakes in Ireland. They didn't go to anybody for holiday. The Poles got a day for Pulaski. They didn't go and beg a day. Why didn't you take a day? You had to go back for even a day to worship a great man. But you failed to understand that King did not operate alone. There was a man at the same time named Malcolm X. <laughs> Somebody told you that Malcolm X preached violence. How the hell you think you got here? By nonviolence? How you think you got lynched? And how you think King died? By a bullet like Malcolm X. Malcolm left a woman named Betty with six daughters, two in her stomach when he died. They've never seen their dad. King left a woman with three children too. What is it about one struggling for you that isn't about the other struggling for you? You'd let people decide for you who fights for you. What made Malcolm less a fighter for you 
than king. They both died fighting in the best way they knew for their people. None worse or none better than the other. But worst of all, you have not one day cried for Rosa Parks. And that sister started all. There's no future for the people who deny their past. My poor parents, my grandparents, my mother, my father did not suffer and die to give me an education to slight, oppress or discourage my people. Because whatsoever education I acquired out of their sacrifice of over 300 years, I shall use for the salvation of the 400 million black people of the world. And the day when I forsake my people, may God Almighty say there shall be no more life for you. I unequivocally rejected the racist assumption of much white American Christianity. Namely, that God had created a black man inferior, and that he had intended Negroes to be a servant class, viewers of wood and drawers of water. Well, I predicated my view of man and the doctrine. If death has power, then count on me to be the real Marcus Garvey I would like to be. If I may come in an earthquake or a plague or a pestilence or as God would have me, then be assured that I shall never desert you and make your enemies triumph over you. Will I not go to hell a million times for you? If I die in Atlanta, my work will only just then begin. For I shall live in the physical or the spiritual to see the day of Africa's glory. When I am dead, wrap the mantle of the red, the black and the green around me. For in the new life I shall rise up first with God's grace and blessing. To lead the millions of the heights and the triumph that you will know. Look for me in a world when there is storm. Look for me all around you. For with God's grace I shall come back with countless millions of black men and women who have died in America, those who have died in the West Indies, and those who have died in Africa to aid you in the fight for liberty, freedom, and life. Any leadership that teaches you to depend upon another race is a leadership that will enslave you. Any leadership that teaches you to depend upon another race is a leadership that will enslave you. They gave leadership to our four parents and that leadership made them slaves. But we have decided to find a leadership of our own to make ourselves free men. Our great scholars having passed through the colleges and universities have thrown away the blessed record. Babylon did it. Assyria did it. France under Napoleon did it. Germany under Prince von Bismarck did it. England under America under George Washington did it. Africa with 400 million black people can do it. If you cannot do it, if you are not prepared to do it, then you will die. You race of cowards, you race of imbeciles, you race of good for nothing. If you cannot do what other men have done, what other nations have done, what other races have done, then you have better die. Can we do it? We can do it. We shall do it. We pray to God for vision and for leadership. And he has given us our universal vision. A vision that will not limit our possibilities to America. A vision that will not limit our possibilities to the West Indies. But a vision that said it must be a free and redeemed Africa. Christ the crucified, Christ the despised. We appeal to you for help, for succor, for leadership. When you endeavor to carry your burden of the heights of Calvary, when white men spawn you, when white men scorn you, when white men spat upon you, when white men pierce your side out of with blood and water gush forth, it was a black man in the name of Simon the Syrian who took your cross and bore it up the heights of Calvary. And now that we are bearing our burden, it being so heavy, we just ask that you just help us on up the heights. Oh yes, the cause is grand, the cause is glory. Surely we shall not turn back. Oh, sail on, sail on, sail on, oh mighty ship of state, sail on, sail on until the flag of the red, the black and the green is perched upon the hills of South Africa. Because the time has come for the black man to forget his hero worship of other races and to create and emulate heroes of his own. We must canonize our own saints, create our own martyrs, and elevate the positions of fame and honor black men and women who have made a distinct contribution to our racial history. Sojourner Truth is worthy of a place of sainthood alongside the Joan of Arc. Christmas Addicts and George William Garden are entitled to the halo of martyrdom with no less glory than the martyrs of any other race. Toussaint Levature's brilliancy as a soldier or a statesman outshone that of any other people. Hence he's entitled to the highest place as a hero among men. 
because Africa has created millions and countless millions of black men and women in war and peace, whose luster and bravery outshine that of even any other people. So why not see good and perfection in ourselves? We must inspire our literature and promulgate the doctrine of our own without any apologies to the powers that be. That right is ours and God. Let sentiments and cross opinions go to the winds. We are entitled to our own opinion and are not obligated to or bound by the opinions of others. If others laugh at you, return the laughter to them. If they mimic you, return the compliment with equal force. Because they have no more right to dishonor, discredit you in manhood than you have in dealing with them. Honor them when they honor you. Disrespect and disregard them when they vilely treat you. Their arrogance is but skin deep. An assumption that has no foundation in morals or in law. They have sprung from the same family tree of obscurity as we have. Their history is as rude in its primitiveness as ours. Their ancestors were running wild in living in trees of branches like monkeys as ours. They made human sacrifices, ate the flesh of their own dead and wild meat from beasts for centuries, even as they have accused us of doing. Their cannibalism is more prolonged than ours. When we were embracing the, the banks of the, of the Nile, they were still drinking blood out of the, out of the skulls of their conquered dead. After our civilization had reached the noonday of progress, they were still living in holes with bats, rats and other insects and animals. After we had already unfathomed the mystery of the stars and reduced the heavenly constellation to minute and regular calculus, they were still backwards men living in ignorance and in blatant darkness. The world is indebted to us for the benefits of civilization. They stole our arts and sciences from Africa. Then why should we be ashamed of ourselves? The modern improvement to be, re to be reflected and resurrected by our generation and our posterity. Why should we be discouraged if somebody laughs at us today? To a time when the emperor first became a symbol of his country and of all Africa. Only a veteran can now remember when the last and most brutal chapter of the European scramble for Africa began. 1935, Italy claimed Ethiopia and Mussolini's troops invaded. Arriverà al benessere, alla potenza e alla gloria. At the League of Nations in Geneva, the Emperor went to plead Ethiopia's just cause. The League, fearful of a shadow which would turn into the Second World War, did nothing. Shamefully, the great powers left Ethiopia to Mussolini and the Emperor to lonely exile in England. His Majesty, Negus Haile Selassie, I call upon the first delegate of Ethiopia. Nowhere, I think, was the Emperor's tragedy felt more deeply than among the black people of the West, the slave descendants in North America and the Caribbean. Black consciousness had dawned in Jazz Age Harlem, and Africa fermented in the exile's hearts. Many supported a black activist called Marcus Garvey, and when he demanded Africa for the Africans and repatriation to the homeland, they saw Ethiopia as a special symbol of the whole continent. Until now, it alone had not been seized by white Europeans. Such people volunteered to fight for Haile Selassie, although only a handful managed to go, or they organized to send relief. Black American rallied towards the cause and black Jamaicans likewise and so the organization was formed in New York, 105th, 1 Lenox Avenue, New York, and as uh, 
East of War Federation Corporation. Those people gave up money, medicine, clothes, and what have you, sent into Hellas Selassie. A branch of the Ethiopian World Federation soon opened in Jamaica, where Garvey came from. But in this neglected corner of the British Empire, black frustration had a new twist. A few ex-followers of Garvey had begun to mix Haile Selassie, symbol of Africa, with biblical notions of a messiah. By abbreviating Jehovah, or Yahweh, to Jah, and adding this to the emperor's earlier name, Rastafari, they created the invocation, Jah Rastafari, a black messiah for their redemption. It would be years before any followers of the Rastafarian faith reached Ethiopia. The emperor knew nothing about them, as he himself returned, with British military help, to reclaim his throne. Look what Mussolini is trying to do. Take a bigger mouthful than any man can do. The drums are beating and the bugle call. But the cannot let the lion of Judah fall. So let us take a turn in our hand and defend the Ethiopian war. Declare. Chancellor Bismarck, the most powerful man of his time, invites to his palace 16 diplomats from the leading Western countries to sit together around a table. Their aim, to divide up between themselves a continent, Africa. And they will succeed. Even before 1900, there came a new source of conflict, settlers from Europe. French in the far north, Dutch, and then British in the far south, and some Germans. Other settlers were attracted to the good farming land of the east, to Tanganyika, northern and southern Rhodesia, and the British territories of Uganda and Kenya. Once again, nobody asked permission. An early French governor had laid down the golden rule. Wherever good water and fertile land are found, he said, settlers must be installed without questioning whose land it may be. The settlers, not surprisingly, agreed. The next step in East Africa was to build a railway from the coast to the interior. The line was completed in 1901 and millions of acres of good farming land in Kenya were opened to white ownership and settlement for the buying price of next to nothing. These white strangers, oddly enough, were at first welcomed by the African inhabitants. But the welcome didn't last for long, for they soon discovered that colonial government wanted them to give things, above all, their land and their labor. These colonial demands provoked a repeated resistance. And against that resistance, the colonial government, with white settlers arriving in ever larger numbers from Britain, waged a war with little mercy and, of course, with rifles and machine guns against spears and arrows. This beating down of a sometimes violent and desperate African protest was called pacification, or less junior British minister in London cabled this protest. Surely it cannot be necessary to go on killing these defenceless people on such an enormous scale. The minister's name was Winston Churchill, but on that occasion his intervention had no effect. <laughs>
Maga ya kake zaka maka hiri ga legu kwa no mata na kuhu maka hiri ga kewe ga teka nekea mudo ngu mwa na mare kuwa maka inga to maka olega kwa mese ni. By 1915, about four million acres of African farming land in central Kenya had been given to about 1,000 British settlers. By the 1920s, about half of the able-bodied men of Kenya's two largest farming peoples, the Kikuyu and the Lua, were working as laborers for British newcomers. How was that done? The answer, once again, was something new in Kenya, taxation. To cultivate these splendid acres, it was necessary to make Africans pay taxes in cash. Having no money economy of their own, Africans could pay tax in cash only if they went to work for a European wage. An old Maasai recalls those early days. <laughs> Masai zamani habana lipa kodi ya, ya kichwa kama hile tunaita zamani Poltax likuwa la tulikuwa na lipa na nyumba tulikuwa na hitwa uh, nini uh, mini kodi ya nyumba The Maasai proved particularly good at dodging the payment of the new taxes so the colonial government thought it should send some of these apparently idle warriors to school, so as to turn them, if possible, into tax collectors among their own people. Small boys were seized for this purpose. school. <laughs> On the other side of the continent, in northern Nigeria, the colonial scene was very different. With no white settlers, life was peaceful. Things continued much as before. The British had conquered this huge region, far from the sea, for no real reason other than to keep it from the French. So the British were content with a supervision which allowed them to take a back seat. Under the direction of Lord Lugard, this was called indirect rule. This was the residence of the British official who governed the northern Nigerian province of Kano. Indirect rule meant ruling through local kings, in this case the local emir, who after defeat accepted British overlordship. On condition that nothing was done to modernize or democratize the conquered system, indirect rule was cheap and highly effective. Local kings and princes kept the peace and law and order in their own interest, as well as in that of the British. Both sides at the top had much to gain. So kings like this one, the emir of Katsina, were able to stay in power and even add to their personal privileges. They were able to call on their own local retainers to govern the everyday affairs of the country. In this way, the native governing class, as the doctrine said, was to remain a real living force, as well as being a curious and interesting pageantry. <laughs> are the same as a thousand years ago. There were kings in northern Nigeria when Richard Lionheart set out on crusade. Today, he and all the emirs of northern Nigeria play their part as subjects of the King of England. But their subjects still show their loyalty as in the days when Katsina was warring with her neighbors. Katsina still keeps her way of life, still resists new influences from the world outside. In short, no modernization of any kind, and therefore big problems for the future. I talked to Nigerian professor Obaro Ikeme. For the larger part of Nigeria, British rule did not mean anything for many years. In other words, uh, although at the centers of administration, 
there was a change which could be seen by the people and felt by the people. In the outlying areas, life went on as if the British did not exist. If you take Lugard's own particular area, the north, for example, the seat of the Emir and the seats of the district heads may have felt the immediate impact of the British presence. But the villages were ordered and run just as before, with one important difference though, taxation, that the people had to pay tax to a new power. The British built up a core of Africans who became known as native administrators, um, developed some commitment to the system. Uh, the uh, salaries were comfortable. They had power, uh, which they used to enrich themselves at the expense of their followers and their subjects. Consequently, the British were able to succeed um, largely by developing a core of people who became partners with them. British officers headed by a resident are there in every emirate to advise and assist the emir and his ministers in their day-to-day -day work. And each month, the resident presides at a full meeting with the emir's council. There may be word from Nigeria's governor in Lagos or from the colonial office in London, or the council may discuss the repatriation of pilgrims from Mecca. The dignity of the past the traditions of Katsina are present in the council chamber. Here, once more, this time behind polite words, was the essence of colonial paternalism. In the French colonies along the coast, the scene was both the same and different. Dakar, capital of Senegal, actually the little suburb of Rufisk, a charmingly nostalgic place. Senegal was France's oldest colony in tropical Africa, and one where the French presence, like that of the British in northern Nigeria, could easily be absorbed. Generally, the French ran their colonies on much the same system as the British. But there was one important difference. The British thought that their Africans could never become anything but Africans, and certainly not British. The French idea, on the contrary, was that in the end, at some distant time, all their Africans would become black Frenchmen. The culture and the language of France were offered as the eventual supreme blessings. This idea was called assimilation. Originally, this was a generous idea, but colonial rule reduced it to little or nothing. Yet in four municipalities of coastal Senegal, assimilation did take effect. This picturesque island of Gore, just off the port of Dakar, was one. Here you could go to school and even become a French citizen. But you belonged to a tiny minority. By 1926, only 48,000 Senegalese had become assimilated out of a total of one and a half million. The Senegalese historian Professor Sheikh Anta Diop explains. C'est en fait certain dans la pratique ce n'était pas possible. Et dans la pratique, il y a eu quatre communes ici au Sénégal et partout ailleurs pratiquement, c'était le système de l'indigénat. Donc à cause du rapport numérique, la politique d'assimilation n'était pas applicable sur le terrain. One man from Gore Island who did make it and carved out for himself a brilliant career was Blaise Diagne. Of humble origins, Diagne became the first black man to be elected to the French National Parliament in Paris. He campaigned for black rights and began to win concessions. That was in 1914. During the First World War, an embattled France called for tens of thousands of African troops as Flanders swallowed its victims. Blaise Diagne agreed to be France's recruiting sergeant and his African reputation vanished in the slaughter. I'm 
Il y a des gens qui ont de la guerre. Il y a des gens qui ont fait France had long relied on African mercenaries, even as far back as the Crimean War. But now it was different in scale and in suffering. More than 200,000 African troops, mostly conscripts, were sent to France. And at least 170,000 were thrown into the Holocaust of the trenches. <laughs> Thousands never came home. Others returned with an experience that survivors have still not forgotten. Shoulder to shoulder, white men and black men, equal in the trenches. Were they now to become equal in the colonies? Only the monuments suggested that. With the coming of peace in 1918, the victorious colonial systems looked more strongly entrenched than ever before, though military rule now gave way to civilian government. This led to a far more thorough system of tax collection to pay for the government. The linchpin of the British system was the district officer. Where I come in. I'm the district officer in this particular area. The native authority treasurer sends his figures to me for checking against last year's figures. When it's decided what the tax is to be this year, I go off to tell the chiefs and people what they're to pay and why. That's my wife. I spend so much time doing the rounds that if she didn't come, we wouldn't see much of each other. We take our beds and everything else, as the rest houses where we spend the nights have no furniture. You know, we are very ordinary people, but the pagans still find us a bit of a puzzle with our fuss and bother. That's the local chief. We ask news of the crops and the children. It's like sitting in a shop window. We come here every year and follow the same ritual, but they always behave as though it was the first time. Peace is all very well, but it is dull, and they love a bit of variety. Many colonial officials were good, practical, hard-working people devoted to their ideals. They were sure that the strong paternal arm of colonial rule must be a blessing for Africans and would have to be continued for centuries. They firmly believed that if left to themselves, Africans would simply go on living as before and that, they thought, would be a thoroughly bad thing. An old film tells the story as the colonial officials saw it. This simple life under the hot African sky was once a life of fear and uncertainty. British rule has brought peace. The enterprise of European officials and settlers and of Indian traders has opened up the country. But there is still a long battle to be fought with ignorance, poverty and disease. In these lands, where there are so many changes to be made, much can be achieved by money and the initiative of the white man. In the more favoured colonies, those were the hopes of the 1920s. And in some respects, they were fulfilled. There came the founding of the first modern hospitals, veterinary services, and other benefits of Western life. But all the money to pay for these good things had to come from Africans. So they now began a drive for the export of crops to yield cash. The cash crop era got into its stride. Groundnuts, as here in Senegal, were a crop that brought cash to farmers and to colonial purchasing companies.
But the cash crop's success also brought problems. It is certain that l'arachide has been introduced to alimenté tout simplement la culture, la monoculture de l'arachide a été introduite pour des raisons industrielles, ni plus ni moins. Hein? C'est en 1848, je crois, que des Marseillais l'ont introduite ici euh, pour fabriquer tout simplement de l'huile pour vendre ça sur le marché international. Et on a spécialisé, finalement, euh, la tendance est née de spécialiser chaque colonie en fonction de ce qu'elle pouvait produire le mieux. Et le, on a donc euh, toutes les, les zones sahéliennes ont été spécialisées pour la culture de l'arachide, des, des zones comme la Guinée pour la culture de la banane et, et, et le riz, et ainsi de suite. Mais, mais ça, c'était en fonction, non pas des intérêts euh, locaux des, des indigènes, de ceux qui habitaient ces terres-là, mais en fonction des besoins en matière première des usines qui tournaient à Marseille, à Bordeaux et en Europe d'une façon générale. So long as their crops were bought, African growers could be reasonably content. But in 1929, there began the huge and long disaster of the World Depression, and prices collapsed. Food production for local people, already badly hit because of land taken for cash crops, became a subject of major crop was cocoa, providing the bulk of the colony's exports. The crop was grown and harvested entirely by African farmers, who had to sell it to British and other foreign buying companies. These companies banded together so as to pay the farmers an artificially low price. The farmers of Ghana, then the Gold Coast, nonetheless worked so well that they became the world's biggest producers of cocoa, and so of chocolate which Africans didn't eat. But the gains were far from equally shared. The Ghanaian historian, Professor Edo Boahen. There's no doubt at all that the farmers were being cheated. The prices that were being paid for the cocoa bore no relationship to the prices that they had to pay for the imported goods. We had no say in the pricing of our own commodities. We had no say in what we paid for what was imported. This was in fact one of the greatest indictments against the colonial economic policies. The fact that so much emphasis was placed on a single cash crop. And we had to import rice, we had to import oil, palm, uh, oil and so on, you know, to feed ourselves because so much emphasis and so much attention was paid to this single cash crop cocoa. The colonial governments were just concerned with obtaining raw materials to feed their factories abroad. The raw materials were produced by the skill and enterprise of hard-working African men and women. Yet the advertisements in Europe, deeply racist by this time, presented an insultingly different picture. At the same time, African businessmen found that the trading positions they had established in earlier times were now swept away. There's no doubt at all that before the colonial period, Africans were playing a far more important and dominant, a dominant role in the economy than during the colonial period. There were many of them running their own import-export businesses. In the 1920s and 1930s, all these African merchant princes virtually disappeared from the field because the dice were so much loaded against them as a result of the colonial system. The banks were discriminating against them in the granting of loans. The, the expatriate firms, and particularly the Syrian and Lebanese firms, were undercutting them, and they just could not stand the challenge. And therefore, many of them did simply ran out of business. And the children of these great merchant princes now became the employees of the great African uh, uh, capitalist companies like UAC, UTC, SUA, and so on. Colonial trading companies, British, French, Belgian, Portuguese, monopolized wholesale business with the full backing of their colonial governments. What King Leopold had called this magnificent African cake was beginning to yield its riches. Often those were painful days, but they have to be recalled by anyone who wishes to understand the problems of Africa now. The turmoil of today in the Congo, or Zaire, has its roots in the infamous Congo Free State of King Leopold. Here, the emphasis was on the growing of rubber, and the methods used to extract it were no better than a reign of terror. 
Local people were forced to collect rubber under the most cruel conditions, as these old photographs show. If the rubber they collected was poor or small in quantity, men, and sometimes women too, could expect to lose a hand or foot in punishment. Terrible things were done. An official British fact-finding commission reported the daily agony of an entire people unrolled itself in all its repulsive, terrifying details. Public opinion in Europe grew horrified. Gradually, the agonies were reduced. Yet huge damage had been done, moral as well as physical, and was going to cast a dark and violent shadow over the future of the Congo. Forced labor by the 1920s was practiced on a wide scale in most of the colonies. All early roads and railways were built by forced labor. Much was achieved, but the cost in life and health was sometimes catastrophic. This spectacular railway in French equatorial Africa was built by 125,000 Africans to link the coast with Brazzaville, the inland capital. Beyond doubt, a great feat of engineering. But before a single passenger could travel on it, nearly 14,000 Africans were to die in building it. Travel in comfort came at a price. By the 1920s, the colonial railway map was complete. These lines had one central purpose, to ensure the export of minerals and other wealth, most of all from southern Africa. European mining activity for gold, copper, zinc, diamonds, transformed southern Africa, thanks again to African labor acquired by the usual procedure of administrative force and taxation. Conditions were hard to bear. Some 30,000 Africans died in southern Rhodesian mines between 1904 and 1933, mostly of disease. And wages at the end of that period were lower than they'd been at the start. This labor system was called Chibaro. Very old men can still remember it. Gold mining boomed. In those years of Chibaro, the southern Rhodesian mining industry produced gold worth 87 million pounds sterling, at the cost of 20 dead African miners each week on average for 30 years. Just as in the bigger mines of South Africa, living conditions for miners were appalling. Safety provisions were primitive. Discipline was often brutal. Healthcare almost non existent. Prison labor was used whenever available, and that was often. And child labor, too. Ah, <laughs> After 1930, the whole labor system in large regions had come to depend on people having to abandon their villages and go far away to work in colonial mines or on plantations. This was called migrant labor, a huge upheaval which soon began to destroy the old stabilities of rural Africa. An official British committee in 1935 reported that the old order of society was being completely undermined by migrant labor. The years ahead were going to confirm it. But it was in the Portuguese colonies, especially Angola and Mozambique, that forced labor was at its worst. Labor! 
Here in Mozambique, and by brutal methods, African farmers were forced to grow cotton and to sell it at prices fixed by the colonial government. Prices kept so low that the farmers used to say of the cotton that they were forced to grow, that cotton was the mother of poverty. The raw cotton was sent to textile factories in Portugal and returned in the form of shirts for Africans to buy. All the profits were Portuguese. The more the farmers learned to hate cotton, the more they were forced to grow it on pain of severe punishment. Jail. Fifteen days in jail. The farmers in this old film had no legal means of protest, but they could express their anger by singing anti-colonial songs in their own language. There seemed then no way out, no hope ahead. And before long, the same disaster struck here as elsewhere. Food crops disappeared, and once prosperous areas were hit by famine. In spite of African suffering, settlers arrived in growing numbers. Some were political exiles from the Portuguese dictatorship. Many were poor people hoping for a better life. Sent out to be farmers, most preferred the easier life of the towns. They opened shops and businesses and aimed at the success which had eluded them at home. This actually suited the official colonial doctrine. The Portuguese dictator Marcelo Caetano laid it down in plain words. The blacks are to be organized and enclosed, he said, in an economy directed by whites. Logo ni sungula kubula bula ni bula ni ni te kadi kadi mshadore ni sekretari wakwe le sabo a governo wa maputukes. The government has been in the government of 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 the Africa. Mass resistance was to develop later. But already, even the poorest and least educated Africans could see that colonial rule had much more to take than to give. Whatever good may have come from colonial rule has to be measured, unfortunately, against the essential aims of each of the colonial systems. These aims were frankly stated. They were to extract wealth. We've looked at some of the ways in which wealth was extracted by the use of forced or cheap labor, by the seizure of land, by the incessant pressure on growing crops for export rather than crops for local food needs, and always by the deliberate treatment of Africans as inferior beings.
Whatever appearances might suggest, Africans in fact were no longer prepared to accept their permanently inferior status. All over the continent, the first signs of a new political dissent had already begun to appear. In the 1920s, for example, with the protest action of Harry Thuku in Kenya, at the same time with Kaisley Hayford and his companions in British West Africa. And perhaps above all, with Herbert Macaulay, often called the father of Nigerian nationalism. But their demands were small. Uh, some of these early nationalists were completely taken in by the British system. They thought it was a good thing, and that we should become part of that good thing. And the real pressure was for the British to become a bit more liberal. During the 1930s, and notably with the rise to prominence of the fiery but very effective Nigerian nationalist Namdi Azikiwe, much stronger and more far-reaching demands began to be made. Men like Azikiwe used the press where this was possible, as it was in British West Africa. They now sought a mass audience. Politics moved out of polite drawing rooms into the clamour of the streets. So the resistance movement took many forms. And it was not confined only to the elite, as some people tend to think. In fact, it was also evident in the rural areas and even among the ordinary farmers and the ordinary workers. One form of mass resistance took shape in a big cocoa hold-up in the Gold Coast when farmers demanded fairer prices. Once again, the press could be used to good effect. But unfortunately, in the 1930s, there was never any coordination between the protests of the rural folk and the farmers and the protests being organized by the elite. And this is why the resistance movement was not very successful. But now in 1935 came a new and savage challenge to African hopes of progress, another colonial invasion, fascist Italy's brutal assault on Ethiopia, then called Abyssinia. For the first time, the blacks all over the world, this time not even Africa alone, but the blacks all over the world felt that they have been attacked. You know, Ethiopia and Liberia were the only two countries in Africa that were able to maintain their sovereign existence during the period of the scramble and the occupation of the continent by the imperial powers. And Ethiopia therefore became the symbol of hope, not only for Africa, but for the, all the black peoples all over. Ethiopia was looked upon as the symbol of the revival and the regaining of the independence and sovereignty of Africa. And therefore, when this invasion took place, it meant the, the, the complete snuffing out of this last beam of hope. Italy's troops entered Addis Ababa, capital of a now subjected Ethiopia. And still there came no more than verbal protest from outside powers. Yet Ethiopia's defeat, painfully confirmed when her people laid down their arms, sent out a call for action to Africans everywhere. Indeed, for some of us, 1935 now is being considered as the more appropriate date for the beginning of the modern nationalist period of African history, rather than 1939 or even 1945. Because we believe that but for the breakout of the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, probably the struggle for independence would have begun from 1935 as a result of the, of the, of the indignation, as a result of the anger, as a result of the, of the uh, emotions, as a result of the strong feelings of anti-imperialism that were aroused by the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Those feelings were aroused, above all, among the few who could win a modern education at schools like this one, Achimota in the Gold Coast, where Kwame Nkrumah, future leader of the country's independence movement, had been a student. Young people began to read whatever anti-colonial newspapers they could find. Even in the midst of discouraging years, hope flourished afresh. A new generation of educated Africans, some of them trained here at Achimota, was reaching maturity. And then came the tremendous upheavals of the Second World War, surging with revolutionary force through the entire colonial world. 
by 1945, as we shall see in our next program, the scene was set for great dramas in a struggle for independence. <laughs> The Second World War and tens of thousands of young Africans were drafted overseas. The conflict was never really theirs, but for the first time they saw the conditions of their subjugated countries from the outside. They played their part in the winning of great victories, not least in Burma. In 1941, Prime Minister Winston Churchill and President Franklin Roosevelt issued the famous Atlantic Charter, their grand promise that after the war, we shall respect the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they will live. Africa's returning soldiers heard this pledge and it raised high hopes. The promises they had before the war, that after the war some of them will be um, given better jobs and better pay, good money and so on, all, all the rest of it, and they had nothing. The aura of superiority which had been there all along was destroyed by that war, at least for those soldiers who fought side by side with whites. Thereafter, on their return home, nobody could expect them to regard the white man as some uh, little god. He was human, he had his weaknesses, he had his fears, and so on. When peace came in 1945, nothing in the colonial landscape seemed different from before. Yet beneath the apparent calm, strong political pressures were building up. Even in remote rural areas, the message for a different future began to be heard. As well as the returning soldiers and their newfound aspirations, the seething expansion of many colonial towns, often two or three times bigger than before the war, also gave Africa's political leaders a mass audience for the first time. The struggle for independence moved firmly into the streets. Even the slow growth of primary education, wherever that occurred in some British, French and Belgian colonies, began to have a liberating influence. And that influence was carried further by young Africans now studying overseas. Up and down the country, you meet them everywhere. Men and women from the British colonies, working with us, learning from us. Nowadays, they and we share a common citizenship. But today we also share with them a common purpose, a partnership in progress and prosperity for us both. To us in the factory at home, this plan for mutual exchange may seem remote. But we are, every one of us, a part of it. For if the colonies are to send us the food and raw materials we're short of, we must send them the tools to do the job. We shan't complete so great a task overnight, but from every piece of equipment we can send to the colonies now, we stand to share the benefit ourselves in the future. Looking back, one may well marvel at the complacency of the men who ruled the colonies from the tranquil there the rulers wanted to move very slowly. Indeed, these worthy men deceived themselves. And their awakening to reality came from where it was least expected, from the Gold Coast, always considered to be Britain's model colony. A dramatic day of 1948 here in the capital Accra shattered that official complacency. Gold Coast troops had fought hard battles in Burma. They'd been part of what was called the Forgotten Army. Home again, the survivors once more felt themselves forgotten. They decided to march to the castle and present their grievances to the governor. With the castle already in sight, they arrived at this point along the road to its approach, and here they ran into a cordon of police armed with rifles barring the way. This angered the ex-servicemen. They'd come in peace. Now there were protests, shouts. Tear gas was thrown by the police 
and stones were thrown back. The march had begun to fray into a fight, at which point the European officer in charge of the police lost his head. He snatched a rifle from one of his men and opened fire with it into the marching veterans, killing or wounding several of them. I saw exactly what happened. They were stopped, and then the soldiers started shooting. Why should they stop them? Then they started throwing tear gas to spare them. And through the tear gas, all of them, they scattered all over the place, and then took stones, they started throwing stones. And through the tear gas, the enemy gave a command, and they started to shoot. I was right behind them, just like that. They started to shoot. Lance Corporal Atipo, he was shot dead. Another colleague of mine, a classmate of mine at Kofrobia, he was shot at the hit. I gathered him with a couple of my friends and put him on the wayside. But it looks awkward, one will fight in Burma for three good years, returning home and then come to die at the crossroad. I mean, he, he, I mean the whole thing took it by surprise. Then one, one uh, soldier fell, another fell, and the third one. The fourth one, it's a schoolboy who was standing right between the two of us, myself and a friend of mine, behind. The bullet came through. Him and the boy fell. I, I held him up and found that the bullet passed through his ties and came out from his boxers. He fell, died later. In itself, this was a rather small colonial killing, and yet it was to have a tremendous significance, for it exploded into rioting and looting here at Accra and rapidly in other towns. And those riots were the prelude to a strong political demand for independence. And that demand for independence now found its spokesman, a young nationalist with a vision of a free and progressive Africa. His name was Kwame Nkrumah. He formed a party for immediate action and thousands rallied. His right-hand man was Komlo Bedema. We got more following because we were more youthful, more active, and more forceful in our speeches. Uh, as a result, the, the youth, of course, it's more especially because of Nkrumah's personality, they flunked to our side. Because you pushed harder? We for... pushed harder and asked for more things than the elders would do. We wanted self-government now. When the Kusi constitution came out, they said uh, self some form of self-government should be given to the people. We said we want a full self-government now. Big news from the Gold Coast, where the people recently went to the polls under the new constitution. The paramount chief of Accra was there with his retinue to record his vote, and everywhere in the capital, the people gathered to play their part in the democratic process, the free election of members of the Legislative Assembly. Although Nkrumah himself had been... The whole world rejoiced in 1951 when Nkrumah had become the leader of government business straight from jail. And uh, they were watching us to see what we were going to do. So it was important for us to try and show that we were responsible persons, not uh, uh, street boys just come into office. We, we, we went down to the work of running the administration, and some of us really hit it. We made a mark. In 1954, with new elections and another victory for Nkrumah and his party, the Gold Coast edged another step towards independence. Seven years earlier, the British had withdrawn from India. Now they set about dismantling their African empire. Under Nkrumah's lead, these were exciting days. Professor Edu Boahen remembers. The 1950s, to me, were the most important and the most fascinating period in the history of this country. This was the period of the struggle for independence. It was a period of hope, period of expectations, great expectations. And this was the period when far more was achieved during the, the period from 1951 to 1954. So a pace of development in this country which, has never been, which it has never seen. 
In 1957, the British duly completed their promise and the Gold Coast became the first colony south of the Sahara to win its independence. Nkrumah renamed the country after an ancient West African empire. He called it Ghana. Ghana, Ghana is the name. Ghana, we wish to proclaim. We will be jolly, merry and gay. The 6th of March, Independence Day. It was one of the truly memorable moments in Africa's recent history that I've been privileged to watch and witness. By winning independence, Nkrumah fired the imagination and raised the hopes of black people everywhere. Not only in the Gold Coast or Ghana as it now became, but throughout the black continent and even across the seas. They believed that Ghana's independence was going to be good news for them as well. And Nkrumah for his part was determined to prove them right. Nkrumah lost no time in proving that he meant just what he said, that Ghana must lead the way for the liberation of all the other colonies. He saw beyond nationalism. He saw it as a prelude in Africa to internationalism, to the building of a unity and freedom that should become continent-wide. In Ghana at this time was the future leader of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe. 